Hello, Project people. Welcome to the Project Chatter podcast. I'm Val Ma- Val Matthews, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Dale Fung. Hey, Val. Hey, folks. Hi. Hey, mate. <laughs> uh, before we jump in into the pod and meet our lovely guests, uh, don't forget to subscribe on whichever platform you listen to for your good podcasts, and on our YouTube channel for bonus bits with our guests. On this episode, we're joined by Karen Hurt and David Dye. Hey, Karen and David, how are you going? Uh, good. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thanks so much Great for having us. The... Pleasure Great to be with you. Show. Thanks, guys. Uh, before we get on this pod and start talking to chat, or oh, start chatting to Karen and David about leadership and culture and the importance and impact it has on the organizations, uh, we should talk about her and his bio. So I'll hand over to David to Dale now. Cheers, Val. So Karen Hurt and David Dye help leaders break through, achieve breakthrough results with without losing their soul. They're the founders of Let's Grow Leaders, an international leadership development and training firm. They're the award-winning authors of Courageous Cultures, How to Build Teams of Micro Innovators, Problem Solvers, and Customer Advocates. Winning Well, a manager's guide to getting results without losing your soul. I love that. Karen is a top leadership consultant and CEO of Let's Grow Leaders, a former Verizon wireless executive. She was named to Inc. Magazine's list of great leadership speakers. David is a former executive, elected official, and president of Let's Grow Leaders. Karen and David are committed to their philanthrop- philanthropic, oh, I struggled with that word, initiative, winning wells, building clean water wells for the people of Cambodia. Wow, amazing stuff. Let's start there. Um, winning wells. I love to start on, on that because it's about, you know, paying it forward. Um, how did that all start for, for the two of you and um, how's it going? So it's going really well. We have, are just about to pass the 100 wells threshold. We'll, we're on building 103 as we speak. So wow. that's been really fun. Right. And, you know, because our book is, our first book was called Winning Well, and we wanted to have a philanthropic leg to the organization. We're like, wait, winning wells. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> That'll work. We were sitting with a, uh, a friend of ours who leads a nonprofit that supports families, women, and children throughout Southeast Asia. And they do, as part of their work, a clean water initiative. And Karen and I were there and, and uh, we had done a little bit with them previously. And, and uh, she looked at me as they were describing the clean water and went, winning wells. And at that point, all you can do is say, brilliant. <laughs> and thus it was born. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely amazing. And can others get involved? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I would love to chat with folks about how to do that. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So so get in touch if, if anyone's interested in doing that. Yeah. Um, but I just want to um, start off at the top and ask, because there's a lot going around about leadership, culture, behaviors, the works, and um, there's just so much online as well. Why is it such a big thing? I mean, surely in this day and age, we have leaders that know how to lead leaders that know how to build cultures you would be surprised <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just kidding I mean yeah I you do but... you know it's it's really interesting you know so many people we talk to have not had formal leadership training I mean that, that it really is it, it is an issue and we are finding right now um, in the middle of where all these companies have had to pivot quickly either pivot quickly to a work at home model or they are have first responders who they're trying to keep safe, but everybody is in the middle of an unprecedented change, unprecedented change that they had not anticipated, right? So they're having to do the best they can with what they have from where they are. This is not a time where you can just want top-down leaders saying, oh, I figured it all out. I know exactly what to do. Let's go do this. This is a time where you need leaders who can really tap into the best thinking of every employee and be able to say, what do people need? Then create clarity of where you're heading and then staying curious about what needs to happen next. So those are more advanced leadership skills to be able to lead well um, in the middle of a pandemic. And then in general, when you look at the stats, 98% of managers say they need more training, bottom line. And 50% say they basically have received no training. And which is just a fascinating reality and and so much of the impetus for the work we do and the passion we have is because we both have been leaders in the workforce. We know what it's like. 
and we have compassion for those folks who are struggling to get results and build the relationships and they're torn between and betwixt. And it doesn't have to be that way if we have the tools and understand what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, often you look back and, and some of the, the, the managers, I'll call them not leaders, um, have been put there kind of uh, against their will almost sometimes and because perhaps they've been there long enough or perhaps they were the subject matter expert but aren't, as you say, equipped to get there. And and you can challenge me on this, but I've often said to people, you know, you don't need to have a title to be a leader. You don't have to be a certain age to be a leader. You can you can be an apprentice and you can be a leader. Um, and I, I wonder if you if, if you wanted to comment on on that aspect and, and and how anyone listening to this pod, whether you have 25 years of experience or two, can actually tap into that. Yeah. yeah. So I think the best definition of are you a leader is do you have followers? <laughs> are people, are you being influential and do people care what you have to say and are willing to follow you where you want to go? And so, you know, when you think about project leaders, a lot of uh, project managers are informal leaders because they don't necessarily have the position power to, you know, say, you must do this because I said so. It's all about influence and leading through a matrix organization. So, you know, it's how do you show up with confidence and humility, focus on results and relationships and have a vision to move people toward. Because ultimately the type of control that we're talking about, that's illusory anyway, it doesn't actually exist. And influence is what's there. And so to be able to have that kind of leadership influence from any position, that's what's going to make you a strong and effective leader when you have a title. It's not the title that does it. It's the ability to have the influence that you have at any level. And so many of the tools that we share with leaders, you can use them from anywhere in the organization. You don't have to have a particular role. There are some that, that work that way, but most of them are available to you from any kind of leadership. Position. Yeah, it's been interesting because we've been doing a lot of live online training programs right now. And I think because, it, because it's easier to bring a lot of people together from all different parts of the organization, you're not flying people in, we're finding that organizations are being more inclusive than they have in the past. Right? So if you have to fly everybody and rent a space and do that, we were like, well, let's go to our box, not, you know, our succession plan and pick only the really high potential people. Now they're like, well, it'll cost the same if we put, you know, 50 people versus 20, let's bring all 50. And so we're having more of a hybrid where we're seeing some individual contributors, some people who are in a, you know, more of a supervisor and some people who are more in a middle management, all going through the training together. And it's great to see the individual contributors come back and say, you know what, I just tried that tool on my boss and it worked, <laughs> you know? And so that, I think that's, we're going to have a side effect of, of more of that continuing to happen. Yeah, and, and I, I agree. I think it's needed as well. Um, we, we've discussed on some of our previous pods um, that, you know, this dinosaur leadership um, that, that, you know, sometimes often exists. Um, we should have a smidge of empathy towards them because they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And so then it becomes incumbent on us to educate them, um, you know, and lead upwards, I guess, is, is, is what you're trying to say, which is great as well. I want to also touch on... Um, you know, when your leadership's a, a continuous journey, right? You're never a complete leader. But I wanted to touch on the balance between being emotionally effective as a leader versus the intellect you require to run a business, corporation, team, organization. Is there is there a, a good balance? Is is there the right balance, or does it depend on your setup? Is, is there a magic number? <laughs> is there a good optimization exercise? <laughs> Uh, my first, my first answer would be sure it can depend on the situation, but if I had to, if you had to say, which would I rather have, if you were just forcing me into it, do I want 60, 40 intellect emotion or 60, 40 emotion intellect? I'd go with the emotion first because the ability to connect and bring people along and support a multitude of people who are solving, solving problems, looking at the world who are smarter than you are and the ability to influentially bring them together to solve problems that are bigger than any one of you, I would take that first over keen insight. Keen insight is valuable and has a good role to play, but from a leadership perspective, the ability to bring people together and solve a bigger problem 
is essential. And I would say the humility to surround yourself with people who will challenge you. So, and, and that is especially now, you know, to, to say, okay, I do need to know, have somebody who's going to be really thinking strategy and I need somebody who's really going to be doing contingency planning and, and pulling that team of people together and then having the humility to know that you might need to change course. We were talking with uh, uh, one of our, our clients earlier today. They have 12 different contingency plans going because well, if the, you know, if because what's going to happen? We, we don't know what's going to happen with COVID. We don't know what's going to happen with the politics. We don't know what's going to happen with social unrest. And all of these could have an impact on their strategic direction. And I love it. I, I love how careful they're being, but it's all grounded in this human connection and the willingness to say, we don't have it all figured out. I, I know they're going to have a great 2021 because of that. Mm. No, that's great. Some great points there. And um, you, you brought up a few interesting facets. I mean, we think about um, picking the best team is a bit like fantasy football. So I'm going to have one of them and one of them. I'm going to mix them into this project environment and it's going to be perfect. <laughs> and I find sometimes a lot of the times in projects, you don't get that choice or the choice is taken away from you. And um, you're, you're then kind of put in a position of coach and you've got to turn the team around kind of thing like the Mighty Ducks scene, you know? So how do you... Do you have any thoughts about how you might um, deal with a team that may not understand leadership and empathy and, and, and be courageous at that point in time? And what, are, what are the tips and tactics you could share with us today about that? Well, the first thing is get to know your players, get to know your team, because everybody's bringing different abilities to the, the team and to know what those are and to be able to leverage those requires you to understand them. And for the person who just needs some data and then to turn loose and they'll solve a, an interesting problem, um, versus the person who needs to draw attention and, and represent the work. And there's just so many different things that people bring to the table. So that's a starting place is to get to know your people and build that connection so that you can leverage and come together to solve that, that, that problem or build that project that's bigger than what any one of you could do. And to not force, if somebody is really bad at something, figure out how to way, a way to take what they're really good at and have them work on those things. I mean, we, you know, <laughs> we talk about this all the time. We have a very small team. And so it's, we're constantly like, okay, well, well this person could do this and this and this, but we, we, they're not going to ever be able to do that. So let's stop pretending and, mm -hmm. you know, move that work to someone else. And, but they, but they're contributing so well in other areas. We tried it, it didn't work. So let's keep, keep restructuring. The, the kind of leadership I think about when you describe that kind of thing, I think of Dumbledore from Harry Potter. Like he had this incredible <laughs> yeah. group of uh, on some level misfits, right. And, but they all had something that they were bringing to the table and that ability to tap into those different people and bring them together to do something bigger phenomenal yeah that's a that's a really really great analogy it's, it's almost like the orchestra you're trying to make sure that everyone can play the instrument that they're best at um and, and try and extract and i guess bring along those those um those strengths and it's about identifying people's talents and people's talents move as they yes. find new things and experience new things they go oh that's interesting i might want to experience some of that and i think there's a there's a level of trust that has to happen at the leadership level to let people make mistakes and try new things um, in a project world. And, and maybe Dale can, can attest to this as well Is sometimes you're not allowed to make mistakes or it's not considered a, an environment for making mistakes because of the pressures. Um, what do you suggest leaders should do in that situation where they're kind of, they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place when it comes to allowing their team, the freedom and flexibility to find their strengths and, you know, recalibrate themselves under the new organization. Do you have any ideas there? Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you are in a, um, an environment that there's zero tolerance for mistakes, then you need to know that. Right. And there are certainly, you know, yeah. I want the guy flying the plane to not make any mistakes or the person's Perfect. doing some, right. So yeah. you, you, are there, that's where I think you need to do the scaffolding with the checks and balances. Right. So you're, you, you, give them the room to do the work, but you are checking in before it goes to the next step. And, uh, and you're teaching along the way. And so, and you're breaking tasks down too, so that you don't just give somebody the entire project and say, go do that. And then you get to three quarters of the way through and realize you have a challenge. 
but do this part and then let's come back and let's meet and let's do this part and come back and meet. And so, and then I think also partnering people, your more senior people with your more junior people. So it doesn't have to always be you who's doing those checks and balances. Yeah. Mm. That act of partnering, you know, even in these scenarios where you're flying a plane, there's a co-pilot. There's yeah. an assumption that a mistake will still happen, but now we've got a fail safe in place where there's a check and balance and the ability to speak up and the same in a, in a surgical theater, right? So those kinds of situations, those things exist. And then we had a, a, a client who the work that they did, engineering work, had an incredibly small margin of error. I mean, basically they had to have 100% uptime on their solutions. So, you know, it's a 0.0005% chance that it could go down. Like it can't. Mm. And we were talking about taking healthy risks and the CEO said, yeah, risks, risk is for weekends, <laughs> which I thought was hysterical. <laughs> but even in those kinds of situations, there's opportunity to improve and you can improve the process by which you reduce the risk, right? It, it doesn't mean that you're going to compromise what it is that you're delivering, what you're doing. It's about cultivating the environment where the playing field and the boundaries are clear. So here's what we can work with in order to achieve a better result. And who doesn't want that if we structure it that way? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you're probably going to get a lot of nods. Yes. From, from Dale and I, we, we talk about that <laughs> leadership a lot and, and how we can influence the projects that we work on. Um, Dale and I've worked on some pretty pressurized project environments as well. And, and this, these are just observations feeding back through to you guys. I love the analogies. Dale, I had no idea we we're going to have an analogy street situation where we're going to just keep playing back and forth analogies with Karen and Dave, <laughs> but it's great. I love it. I love the plane idea of the co-pilot. That's fantastic. We use one, um, the head chef and the sous chef. Mm -hmm. So we always get the head chef to check out meals before they go out. Um, so the same thing we do with our reporting, let's say. Uh, yeah, it's a really good to have some type of structure that everyone can kind of relate to. I think that's one of the other issues with leadership is, how do people relate to it? And speaking to some of the executives, um, just switching gears in terms of buy-in. So sometimes they're not convinced themselves. Maybe it's because they are the, the dinosaur generation, but when we talk about leaders, but sometimes they struggle to see the intent, it's called the tangible benefits of intangible training, if you like. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're teaching them these soft skills as they call them. I don't know what you term, I, I don't really use the soft, so, uh, soft kind of skill uh, uh, terminology, but they mention this and then, and then there's like, well, what's the benefit if I take everyone out of, of work for, or the project for two days or five days, or whatever the training is, I bring them back. What's my tangible benefit. And it's hard for them to, to kind of bring themselves understanding the benefits of it. But is there some way of, of shortcutting that for them? I think, well, one of the things that we are very, very serious about um, is space learning over time and giving people an opportunity to apply the skills immediately once they learn them. So yeah. our ideal, structure is a six module live online now it's live online program where you come you work you learn a skill then we say okay between this week and the next time we're together you're going to go do this with your team and then we they come back and they say okay what how did this work and uh you know and then we have some ways to reinforce it in between but it's that immediate applications and you're working on real work it's not mm. just theory. It's not like, oh, you should build trust with your team. Here's how you build trust. It's like, go have this conversation, this tough conversation you've been needing to have. And, and the light bulbs and the ahas of, oh, well, work just got easier, you know, or, and, and, you know, so I think that's part of it. And then I think another piece of it is, you know, what are, what is the ROI? Are you looking to improve retention? Are you looking to improve employee engagement? You know, a lot of the work that we're doing right now around courageous cultures is about bringing people's ideas. Well, are you implementing the ideas that people came up with? What, what is the impact of that on your business? And to be asking those kinds of questions. And if you're trying to sell this kind of training in, which obviously we are huge believers in the value of it, to ask the questions and think about where does that person, what are their goals? What do they want to achieve? And what's frustrating them? You know, oh, we've got these inefficiencies and we're not delivering on time. Okay, why is that happening? Well, we've got misunderstandings and the people aren't communicating well. So, okay, so if we could get people the communication skills to ensure that after a five or a 10 minute conversation, they're on the same page and aligned with what they're doing going forward, how much money would that save you? And lost time and missed deadlines and and so forth. So you can you can start to quantify, well, here's what it's costing us to not do it. So if we could 
address that at some level, what's that going to do for us? Yeah, I think another piece of it is involving the leaders as teachers so that you're not just training, but then you have a way that you're working with the people's managers to help it create an infrastructure of reinforcement. And that's where you really start to see the sustainability. The other day, it was interesting, we have a CEO who is going through the program as a participant, so which is pretty neat because he's a pretty, I mean, it's a big organization. And so mm. he's sitting, but he's in the breakout rooms on the Zoom and he's doing the exercises and you and he's just not acting like the CEO. And it's a high pressure industry that they're and in. And he, afterwards, yeah. so then we always do this thing afterwards, like, okay, because we always end on time. So we always end on time, but just as we would if you were in our conference room, we stay back to answer any questions. So we, it's always curious to see who stays back. And it's always, that's always been the best conversation, but he stayed back and he said, I'm trying that tool. I'm using it with my team. <laughs> like, yes, right? I mean, that's mm. that's how you see the value because he's, you know, he's using it on real work with his team. Yeah, that, that's truly amazing. Do, do you have any stats in, in terms of before and after in terms of some of the, the tips you're providing? Yeah, I mean, we have some, yeah, so like, oh, we have this one uh, group that was an energy company and we did work around, you know, accountability training and how do you give feedback to the people on the phones and mm. how do you get them focused on the most important things and, you know, their, their net promoter score, this is going up if you're listening, is going up, <laughs> way up. <laughs> and another uh, engineering firm I'm thinking about that uh, when they called us for help, they said, we need some, some leadership development. We, and, well, what's going on? Well, all of our top performers are leaving for the competition. So we have a massive attrition problem and right. then a uh, retention problem. And then uh, uh, we're on probation with our number one customer. Uh, so we need help. So six months uh, of spaced learning over time and doing the work and, and le strictly leadership and management development. And six months later, they had flipped to where they were now, they had become the vendor of choice for their number one client utility organization. And one of their favorite things, this is where they get the big smile on their face, is that their competition had become their outsourcer for their low performing talent. So they weren't having to fire their low performing talent. They would just let their competition recruit them away. Their top talent was sticking around because wow. the leadership had improved, the culture had improved, and they knew they were valued and they were learning and growing and, and all those sorts of things. So no, those are just a couple of examples. Yeah, I mean, it's so, and sometimes it's hard to isolate the variables, right? So, you know, uh, yes, you're working with a, you know, they go through the training and revenue increased. Well, can we claim all the credit for that? You know, it's hard to tell, right? So, yeah. um, but we do definitely see, here's what happens. Our clients hire us back. They wouldn't do it if it wasn't going to have, if it wasn't making an impact and their results. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I, I think you can claim some uh, impact uh, <laughs> if you've increased revenue. <laughs> um, but no, that's fantastic. And you, you talk about um, leadership and culture there. And obviously, you, you've, you've got, you know, a couple of books out, a couple of great books, and, you know, one on culture. Um, and I'm just wondering how much uh, responsibility or accountability is it on incumbent on a leader to create that culture versus everyone in the organiz organization to to create that culture because again it, it's one of those things that it, it's not very distinct is you know the, this is where everything fits so let's start with what we mean by culture so we have a particular favorite definition of culture which is not ours it's from seth godin the marketing guru uh, he says culture is simply people like us do things like this so it's how people like us act it's what we do and so where does the responsibility for that lie? Well, the reality is everybody creates that culture by the actions we take. But it's a leader's job when we're taking responsibility for it to influence, lead, and ultimately produce the culture. And if we don't, we're still producing a culture. It's, you know, it's just not one we've consciously chosen. And so that's the work that leaders do is by their actions, by the things that they say, by the things they reinforce, by the things they don't say and that they don't reinforce. All of that is contributing to whatever people like us do. So, you know, we were just talking with a client today who they have a culture of timeliness and punctuality. And their punctuality means that I don't think we've ever been on a meeting where the majority of the people didn't show up 
30 seconds to two minutes for these online meetings before the meeting was scheduled to start. Whereas in many organizations, you know, if the meeting starts at the top of the hour, you'll have people trickling in for two, three, five minutes. Mm. You know, that's a culture. People mm. in that organization, people like us are on time. We show up prepared and ready to go. And on time means we're there 30 seconds or a minute early. That's reinforced. And people are held accountable for it. It's stated, and then the accountability is there. All of that is leadership work. Yeah, no, agreed. And 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 then obviously ethics play a part in that as well. Um, group ethics is 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 another thing. Um, but it's interesting, as you say, it, ethics again. It it's not a it's not written down to go. This this is what ethics is because ethics is it's dependent uh, yeah, um, on on various aspects. Um, and I'm wondering again, should they be written down, perhaps? Should ethics be written down to create a culture? So, uh, so this is we we had did this work with uh, this company that was really it's fast growing, and they came and we got in at the beginning with them pretty much. I mean, not their very beginning, but as they started to really say, "Oh, I think we really need to be deliberate about our culture." And so we've been working with them for several years now. The interesting thing is it started by them writing down, these are our values. Lots of people do that. That's no big, no big deal, right? But we help them and then we help them define it. Also, lots of people do that. What was different about what they did was they created these scenarios and, some, and they're like, okay, well, what if this value is in conflict with that value in this real life situation? And they pulled these like crazy stories that had actually happened. Real life behavior And then like scenarios. changed the names. And, and then in their all hands, they went, okay, well, what if this? And they pop it out and they put people into breakout rooms and they had the conversation. Like, and so that's like when the rubber meets the road, how are you going to um, manage your value of compassion with you know, the, your customer experience and fa fascinating. And, and guess what? They have a great culture. And mm -hmm. so now, now they've just done an acquisition and now they're like, really, it's one of the top things. Like, how are we, who's going to be in what seats and how are we going to make sure those values get <laughs> over there? Right. And, and like, it's not soft. It's, she sees it as so critical to the future of the, of the merged organization. And then having the executives tell the stories of, okay, so that was what happened. That was the circumstance and everybody does their piece. And then the executive sharing, and here's what I did. Here's what I actually did in that situation. And here's how I see the interplay of those uh, working out in reality. Here's where this value goes and where that one stops and where the next one begins. And that's the work of ethics. And that's the work of culture and values is getting them from words and definitions on the wall into behaviors and into the real life application where there, yeah, that it's, that's fantastic work to be able to do. It, it sounds fantastic because I love a sports analogy. Um, and some of the best teams in the world, right? You train harder than match day, right? So that you're prepared for when match day comes. Um, but as Val says, not, not on, on highly pressurized projects, you don't always have that luxury of time. Right. Um, and, and so we're constantly trying to recreate that 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 space, uh, sort of simulate that 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 you know conflict as as you call it potentially. Um, but that's great insight. The other thing I wanted to touch on, um, you mentioned it earlier, was communication skills. Now everyone goes, you got to have great communication skills. But what does it actually mean? Because also in various cultures, right, you can be more direct or less, or or you have to be less direct, dependent. So how do you? obtain that it, do you just go and just try it out how do you do research on someone you don't know do you go and stalk them on linkedin what, what, how do you get around doing um communication good <laughs> to put it plainly so in terms of the skills that that make for good communication skills you know when we talk about clarity clarity of expectations and creating a shared understanding of what success looks like that is almost leadership responsibility number one, is no one can go anywhere until we have a shared understanding of what success looks like. And so there are some, some subset of skills that go into that, like what we call it the MIT, mind the MIT, what's the most important thing? Um, what is it that matters most? And what does that look like? What does that break down to look like behaviorally? So, you know, that kind of clarity is the start of those communication skills. Another important one that goes with that is a check for understanding. 
is to close those loops and make sure that whatever it is you or the team are communicating that there's a send, that there's also a receive and that they match. That is a fundamental communication skill. Being good at communication means that we do that very well. Um, then from there, when you talk about uh, accountability, being able to have those kinds of conversations um, effectively in a way that both achieves the results and build relationships. So we share an INSPIRE method. It's an acronym that walks people through how to do that. Those are all fundamentals in terms of the communication skills we're talking about. Now, when you're talking about cultural differences, there are ways to bring those together. But remember that culture is what people like us do. So you can create a mini culture. You can create a spin-up culture. We're going to spin up a project team for the next six months. Here's how we are going to do things. And I know we're all coming from different teams, different places, maybe different uh, global cultures, whatever that looks like. Here's what we're going to do. And if someone's struggling with that, let's say that they're from more of a face-saving culture uh, and or they want to protect the, the feelings of their colleagues or team, there's no sense fighting that value. That is a very deep, important value for that person. So to reframe, hey, listen, speaking up when there's an issue or when we might not make it work or when I'm dropping the ball as the leader, like any of those situations, speaking up is the most protective thing you could do. It's the thing that's ultimately going to help us save face. It's the only thing that's ultimately going to protect us in the long run. And to do anything less than that is actually damaging the team. So let's appeal to the value that people have and all of the great things and the ways that they're coming to the team and use that to build the culture we're trying to create. And one of the big techniques that we have been using, which we've been using it before this pandemic and before people were working from home, but it's so much, it's even more critical now, which is five by five communication, which is if something is strategically important, you should communicate it five times, five different ways. And so here's to reinforce this, we've been playing a game with folks. Um, so we said, we call it five by five in five with five. And so we'll say, okay, you've got, we're going to break you into groups of five people in a Zoom breakout room, and you have five minutes to come up with as many creative ways to that you really could actually pull off. We're not talking, you know, rent an airplane and drive a message across, something you could actually do that's creative. And so we put, they brainstorm all these creative ways, and then we bring them back together. And then we say, okay, if somebody will go group by group, and if somebody's already shared that idea of scratch it off, at the end, and then David's like typing in these ideas, people come up with just like a hundred really creative ways to communicate an idea. So then we say, okay, so when you go back in real life to communicate your strategic priority or something that you're a change in direction, Maybe your first thing is going to be, yeah, you're doing it in your team meeting. Maybe your second one is you're reinforcing it in an email. And maybe your third is you're doing it in the one-on-ones with everybody. The second, the, the, the fourth and the fifth way, pick one of these other hundred ways to reinforce it. Mix it up because that element of surprise will make it people tend to remember it. Yeah, no, that's very insightful. Um, and I guess, you know, we've all been through these um, sort of various assessments on personalities and things like that to help you communicate with each other if you understand each other's personalities. And there's lots out there and we won't go into all of those. But personally, I found the best is if I'm going into a new team that I'm expected to lead, and I'll say inverted commas, because you don't lead from the outset, you got to, you know, build those relationships. Um, I do, or I've shared this with Val before, I do what I call speed dating, where I, I take each individual in the team and I sit down with them and ask them what's important to them. And I find that really works to really understand what you have to do to create the environment for them to succeed. Um, but it's interesting because I find that works better than trying to take someone through a personality test and then seeing what the result is. Actually just talking to them directly. Um, but that led me then on to wondering, you, you've, you've, you've trained so many people, right? You've, you've spoken in front of many what is the, I guess, maybe the top three or five things that leaders struggle with? Mm, that's a great question. I, I want to, can I pop in on your earlier question that you were asking? Because uh, another one along those lines that yes, the speed dating that you can get so much insight very quickly. Uh, another one in that realm is what, what work are you most proud of? And 
when people answer that, you learn a lot about them. You learn what motivates them. You learn what they consider their strengths to be. What is what type of work they enjoy most. There's a lot of insight you can get there. So I just wanted to throw that in as your uh, because that was a great technique that you were suggesting. Yeah, I would say the number one thing that we find people struggle with is holding a difficult conversation, like an mm. accountability conversation, because they don't want to damage the relationship, because there's a lot of factors at play, uh, because they want to be liked for all those reasons. And it, and it is hard if you, and if you don't have the tools to do it, it can be tremendously difficult. So, you know, it's always the number one of the six, if uh, the session of a six uh, session session, that's the, that accountability one, people are like writing notes, <laughs> they're all engaged. They really, they struggle. I think, think people struggle with it. It's a universal struggle. I would say the, another one that comes up is um, authenticity, willingness to be vulnerable because they feel like they should, because they're the leader, they should be strong and not, and, and sometimes if that's done poorly, you're actually creating the adverse effect. People don't trust you because you're not human. And I would add, uh, agreeing with both of those, um, I would also add to that prior to the accountability conversation and at the root of so many of the accountability conversations is it is a near universal that people are not as clear as they think they are. And that conversation around what success looks like and the clarity of the results you expect and the way what we're gonna do and what your words mean versus the way they're perceived. We teach this stuff and we still have those challenges. Like I think it is a, when we talk about communication skills, I think that is at the core of so many of the challenges that we have. So. Even if you've got a good strategy and you've got the thinking and you've got the all of those kinds of insights, to be able to clearly communicate and get everybody on the same page, easy to say, it takes consistent, intentional work and humility to do it well. And the higher up you go in the organization, the harder teamwork appears to be. You, you know, when you're talking about senior vice presidents and they have competing objectives and competing priorities and there's only and they're all wanting to be this next level and there's only a handful of slots and that's when the that's when the politics can get really hairy and you know they know intuitively they should be teaming with their peers but they find it really hard and so i think that's that's sort of the advanced version of what's difficult yeah brilliant i think you, you really touched on a good point we haven't talked about yet, which is the politics and office mm -hmm. politics in particular, you know, from corporates to firms to projects. Some of these projects now, I don't know if, you, obviously we all notice these projects are getting bigger, yeah. getting more complex. There's more people yeah. involved yeah. and yet it's still a triangle. If you think about the, the pyramid of how the hierarchy of organizations work, they still got this, it all feeds up to the top. And so there's only a few placements at the top and this doesn't always generate the best team behavior. Right. Because yes. there's aspirational people and some think the way to get there is to put themselves first. And so how, how could we organize, if you've ever thought about this, how could we organize organizations in a, in a better structured way? Or do you think the hierarchy just needs a little bit of training? Well, I think there are a couple of things that go into that. So I'm going to start with, um, let's say that you're, let's start with you're in a senior type of position, even middle management and your work as you work your way up so forth. You have decisions about who you promote into positions of responsibility. And I think one of the most important decisions you make in this regard in the culture that you're going to build and the type of organization that you're ultimately going to create is, are you promoting people into positions of responsibility for other people based solely on results or on results and how they achieved those results? And when you do both and you're paying attention to both and optimizing for both, you're going to get a healthier outcome. Is it perfect? Of course not. We're all human beings. We're always going to have some of those issues, but like as a practical way to begin looking at that, that's a starting place to look. And then from there, like you've got the whole culture and, and what kind of organization are we going to be? And this goes back to people like us do things like this. So in your organization, people are status seeking creatures. That's what it, part of what it means to be human. So do we feed into that in a dysfunctional way? 
Or do we acknowledge that and create ways to bring status based on the work we do as opposed to the politics we play? And how are you measuring success? So this, this is the, I see this all the time. And I'll give you an example from back when I was in my corporate days. So I had, I, I was the store director. So we, I had, so stores that were selling phones, right? And then there was the indirect channel. So they had indirect stores that were also selling. So I had a quota, right? For all of my stores, I had 110 stores and I had a quota for them. Well, what kept happening was, so I had a peer who was in charge of indirect. So basically competitors, but they were still selling the same kinds of phones. Yep. The indirect strategy was, it was a lower cost channel. So they kept building indirect stores and putting them right next to my store. So like there would be the, the corporate store and then the indirect store. So I would go to my boss and say, okay, so you just put a lower cost, you're selling phones at a lower cost within a, across the parking lot from my corporate store. I think we need to lower the quotas. Like, I, of, oh no, 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 you better have year over year growth in that store. And I'm like, and, and I use this as an example because I lived it and I, I'm really passionate about it because that doesn't make any sense. But really they were trying to get the market because his goal was, I just need market share. It doesn't matter, I don't care. But do you think I had conflict? with the dude who was my peer, right? He was a nice enough guy. I was a nice enough human being, but we, we, we would go at it. And, you know, I think that's, no matter how many team buildings, no matter how many beers we had together, we, yeah. because there was a structural problem and a goal problem, probably what they should have done is, this is your joint shared goal. How can you two collaborate to make that number be as high as it needs to be? Mm, right. Yeah. And a structural solution would have fixed the relational issues. And we see that in organizations all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting, uh, particularly in projects, you know, you're starting to see them try to do that by bringing the client in perhaps, you know, you yeah. have this kind of contractor or prime and, and contract client relationship that starts to sour on a long-term project, let's say a five or 10 year project you know, things get tense, performance is low. All they do is increase the, you know, the, the size of the target because if you're, what seems to happen is you get late, but then the target seems to shift upwards because you're just going to have to catch up because yeah. some things are immovable in projects, particularly time yeah. um, where, you know, where maybe they publicly announced a certain date when something's opening or perhaps there's too much writing on it or they haven't got any more money. And so it's, it's really interesting to see, you mentioned about targets and having the right measures for success because that's really important. And, and also having the correct, I guess, structure in place. Yep. And have you seen from a leadership perspective, you know, with all the organizations you've spoken with, that it, it aids to have the client involved, if that's the case? I, I think that when you have the client involved, that's when you're talking about setting a more strategic goal, right? Yeah, I mean, that's when you're talking about what does success look like in terms of reality, like not the politics success look like, not the yeah. scorecard. We always say um, your customer doesn't care what's on your internal scorecard, right? They don't, right, they just yeah. care, right. did you deliver on what you said you're going to deliver? And so I do think, but you don't also don't want to air your dirty laundry in front of the client either. So it's a balance, it's Correct. a balancing it. I'm thinking of where this has gone horribly wrong in one of the airports that we travel in and out of frequently. And it's got this massively delayed, you know, huge multi-year project that's now an even longer multi-year project with a switch completely invented the whole thing, right? Yeah, those are those are problematic. But I yeah, I get the people involved for the high level strategic things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, exactly. there's going to be natural conflict on teams, even with people who yeah. are absolutely aligned. So we, we are in pretty much constant conflict right? because, you know, we both, we have, a, we're a small company. We have a strategic vision. We both are aligned with that, but I've got like the marketing and the strategy and he's working on the operations and I'm wanting to run much faster. And, and any organization, right? you should have that healthy it's, tension. It's right? healthy tension Vision, and it's good, operations, but it like, still leads to conflict. Well, yeah. what do you mean? We have to slow down and look at the process before we can do that. This is a great opportunity. <laughs> we should just go. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because Dale and I are very much the same, you know, we, and we've worked together as well on projects and you're right there. There has to be, we, we say this as well in our teams, there has to be a healthy level of tension. 
but I think there's a there's a there's a amount of time under tension that you should allow. I think if you're always under tension, it it, it tends to yeah. unravel certain people. Um, and yeah. it brings me to a really good point: um, resilience. And you know, given the COVID situation, and a lot of people lost their roles over the last year, and looking for work, and just the change in the organizations and how we approach technology. There's so many things happening. I mean, the last 12 months, I did a presentation last week actually to a global audience and we talked i found some statistics on this covid and they said the the adoption or the adaption rate to technology in the last year is equal to the sum of the last 10 i believe it that's phenomenal i mean Mm -hmm. so for learning organizations like you fantastic yay but but obviously that that puts some tremendous stress under how we operate as a team and, and how that affects culture and particularly resilience do you talk about resilience um and do you have any tips for our for our listeners Sleep is good. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I think the thing is, you know, we say the antidote to uncertainty is clarity. And what do we mean by that? It's not that everything is unknown. There are some things that are unknown for sure, right? But not everything is unknown. Your your strategic direction is, is not unknown. It's interesting. We were talking to a client the other day and they have decided to not establish their sales targets yet for 2021, which is sort of unprecedented for a big sales organization at this point in the year, like we're halfway through November. Yeah. And so I was watching the senior leader talk, communicate with his team. And it, and so like his team's frantic. Why is it, no, what do you mean? I, I, Cause I'm going to be based on them. And he's like, here's what we know. We're headed in this direction. We're going, we need year over year growth. So let's just go after 15% year over year growth. That might change. But if you put all your plans in place for 15% year over year growth, we're not going to be wrong, right? You're going to be doing the right behaviors. And you could just watch everybody like, oh, okay, I know what to do. And he's like, and then you just have to trust that we're going to do the right thing with comp and we're going to figure it out and we'll, we'll give you as much more clarity once we do. And I just thought that's, what, that's leadership, right? When everybody is just like, ah, calm them down, give them something, the next thing to do. And so I think that's part of where resiliency comes from is grounding people in what can you control? What can you do today? And, um, and then also giving people some space, you know, and because you can't push if somebody is just dealing with some crazy thing that's going on in their personal life and you just keep pushing on them, pushing on them, you're, you're, you're just, you're not going to get more productivity, right? So yeah. to take a step back, be compassionate, give them a minute. Uh, one of the things that we did recently was um, we were asked to come in and do day after the election, resiliency training before wow. the election. So we don't know what the outcome is going to be, but we know that people are going to be emotional. So let's teach our managers how to in a neutral way, have this conversation in a way that is supportive and leaves people connected and not divide, divided, you know? And so I think some of those things are, can you anticipate where, where it's going to be rocky and get ahead of it and, and, and create the space? Yeah, I was just going to add to that because I think it's, you mentioned sleep, which is also, that's obviously really important as well, Dave, <laughs> is, is, is that we're talking about trust and having that psychological safety um, within the team. And I guess once you have that, that helps with some form of resilience because you know someone's got your back. Because sometimes right. when you don't have resilience or you, you're under a lot of pressure, um, you, if you don't have that support network, then it starts to affect you mentally, I think. Yeah. Yeah. If you think about your emotional battery, we all have that emotional battery. And uncertainty consumes some of that battery. Well, if I don't trust that the people around me have my back, that consumes more of that battery. And then if I don't, and then I have other angles that like, and so all of that, where's that battery? So the more clarity, like Karen was saying, the more clarity that we can provide reduces the drain on that battery. Then there's actually recharging the battery, which, you know, yes, sleep, yes, time off margin, all of those things that are helpful. Uh, But so as a leader, the trust that you're able to build, if you have that credibility and people know that you care about them and that you have their best there as a human being, you have their best interest at heart while also doing the work. It's not an either or, it's a both and. If they know that, that's gonna ease the drain on that battery. Okay, I know this is hard, but 
I know you've got my back. Let's do this. Yeah. And I think the other thing that we're seeing um, people take more seriously now is putting boundaries around the time that they're working because everyone's, you know, so many people are working in their homes and it's just easy to let it go starting or even earlier and going even later and working through the lunch. And um, so we're actually seeing companies put like rules in place, like no emails after 7 p.m. or, you know, different things like that, which is hard to do um, and it's hard to stick to. But I think it's necessary in, in some circumstances to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's fascinating just listening to that. I mean, a couple of things that sprung to mind, we've, Val and I have previously spoken about freedom in a framework, right? Oh, I like um, that. So, so give them the freedom, but that framework is really, really important as, you know, David's talking about the support, um, the guidance, the, the strategy, so they know where they're headed and they've got that, that, that comfort, um, but they've also got the space, as you were saying, Karen. But I wanted to touch on something you also spoke about, how everything's gone online. Online leadership, to just call it that yeah. phrase. I don't even know if that's the, a real phrase, but online leadership, is that something that's changed the game in a way because personally I, I i found i find presenteeism is far more effective um, from a leadership perspective when you can actually have the person in front of you talking to you rather than behind a, a camera um are there additional skills alternative skills that one has to pick up the first thing we would say is that the all of the principles of effective leadership are the principles of effective leadership and they have been and they will be but the way in which you exercise them can look a little bit different depending on the mode in which you're operating and so when we talk about you know yes having the conversation in person versus this getting adept at the technology you're using affects the quality of the communication that you're having understanding that there's that latency lag and giving that little extra pause for you know, the back and forth and, and all those sorts of things. And, and looking into when you're having a serious conversation, having trained yourself to look into the camera, as opposed to looking at the person's picture, I'm Val, I'm looking at you on my screen right now, but, <laughs> but I come back up here and now I'm making eye contact, right? And so there are those kind of interpersonal skills that we know in person, look them in the eye, you know, your body language, all those sorts of things. Well, there is a translation of those in this environment. Yeah. And then I think it's creating the opportunity for more intimate conversations. It, it, you know, it's, if anything I've learned over the last six months is that, that, that breakout rooms are the best invention ever. And you should always use a technology that allows you to use breakout rooms. Uh, because if it's so difficult, you know, people are going from one of these meetings to the other of these others and half the time they're just turning off their cameras and, and they're just multitasking. And, and so if you, you say, oh, we're going to make this decision, but while we're making, before we make it, we're going to put you in groups of four and I want you to come up with all the pros or cons or whatever it is so that they're forced to be engaged in the conversation because you can't hide in a breakout room of four people. You can hide in a, in a, a meeting of 26 people. And so, you know, we are really big fans of that um, and creating the opportunities for interaction so that people can't disengage from the meeting. And then the, I think vulnerability would be one more mm -hmm. leadership skill, which has always been important, but we are seeing the power of it with leaders who choose to open themselves to their team through this, through this vehicle of remote communication with really powerful results. So I'm thinking particularly about um, a big tech client that we've worked with and an international global team, team leader, tens of thousands of people ultimately on this team. And we had brought, uh, they had brought us in to do a courageous cultures program, building teams of micro innovators, problem solvers, and customer advocates. And this leader started the program with a couple hundred of his leaders by saying, you know, I want to talk about, before we dive into anything, I just want to talk for a couple of minutes here, two minutes about what the last several months have been like. And then he got vulnerable and he talked about how when this started, you know, I was, I was up doing a lot of work supporting our China team. And I thought, well, we just got to get through this and then we're going to be all right. 
Well, then it wasn't just the China team, then it was the Europe team, particularly in Italy, and they were suffering and working through it and having to do all the changes and stress, you know, going back into the spring of 2020 here. He said, and then it wasn't just the Europe team, now it's the US team. And so for months on end, uh, I and my team, we've been dealing with this and it's been sapping and extra hours and all the things. And here's the thing. Uh, he said, I have not been paying anywhere near enough. I have not shown up as a good partner to my spouse. And he has been taking care of our children, our two kids. Uh, I have not been a great spouse, nor have I been a great parent during this time. And I'm very aware of that. And I'm feeling that. And last week, our kids had a COVID exposure. And so now we're navigating through the, the anxiety of that and waiting on the tests and all the things. And and the thing is, I'm not sharing all of that in two minutes because I want your pity. I have that story and that's been my reality and the exhaustion of it. I'm just so tired and I don't have all the answers. And I know if that's my story, I know that story is here 100, 200 times over in every single person that's attending today. And I don't have all the answers, but what I do know is that the people I'm looking at right now, we are able to get through this together. And for the next two days, we're going to be talking about courageous cultures. We're going to be talking about how we come together, about how we build the future together and how we respond together. And I would invite you to be real with one another. I mean, if you could have heard a virtual pin drop and for the next two days, I mean, people were real, they were connected. It was beautiful, but it wouldn't have been that way if he hadn't have started that way. And so as a leader, how can you show up as a real authentic human being is incredibly valuable. And then I, I think, you know, my big fear is that we're going to say, oh, wow, this was so efficient. Nobody ever needs to fly anywhere again. And I think that would really be a mistake. You know, we're, we're going to get through this. And then what is the new normal? And it's, it's probably a hybrid of you don't need to fly to every meeting. And, you know, it's, it's always interesting what, I'm like, why is it, or are the keynotes always in California? Because that's all the way across the country from us. You know, and I'm like, it's, you know, we're going to spend three days, you know, traveling for a one hour keynote, you know? So I think there's a, there's a combination. Mm. You don't always have to be in the room, but some of the time, I think we don't want to lose that ability to be able, to, I mean, virtual happy hours, let's face it, are not the same as sitting and having a glass of wine with somebody after the meeting. It's just Agreed. not, right? <laughs> So, yeah, no, totally agreed. I, yeah. I think virtual happy hours should be banned across the <laughs> I'm, board. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm getting to be over them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, same. <laughs> but I, I, I think love I've that. managed to steer clear of all of them. Oh. I don't even know that I've been to one yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well done. Well done. Need to uh, take a leaf out of your book there. But talking of books, you, you, you spoke about courageous cultures, um, and you've also got winning well. Um, just on courageous cultures first. Um, I think everyone's kind of familiar with what problem solving is and customer advocates, but micro innovators, do you want to touch on that a little bit and tell us the thinking behind micro innovators? Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about innovation, there's so much work around the big innovation, you know, how are you going to get the big new idea, the blue ocean strategy for your company? But what we're talking about when we say micro innovations, it's every employee coming in every day saying, how can we make this better? How can we improve? What's the small change I could recommend to the process? Because I think that's what we are, we're seeing in our research. We were finding that people had ideas, small ideas that would make things better. And they were like, ah, nobody wants to hear it. And nothing's gonna ever happen anyway. And if you can create a culture where everybody sees themselves as a micro innovator, uh, you know, we just uh, wrote, wrote a job description for a new, a new role. And you know, in the job description, we don't want you to just come implement the processes. Your, your job, in part of your job is going to be to recommend what we need to do to change and improve the processes. Yeah, when I was, a, when I was an executive, uh, I would do a meeting with every new hire. Um, anybody who came in the organization meet for, you know, for 30 minutes. And I would say one of your responsibilities is to improve this process that you're in right now, you're brand new, you've been here two days. And in addition to whatever your job is, you've got a, a role to play improving the process of onboarding for the next person that's hired. And in six weeks, I'm gonna to talk to you again. I'm gonna, I want to get your suggestion. 
one thing that's going to make this process better the next time through. Like everybody has that to offer. And we have that to offer in our work, in the, in the interactions we're having with one another, with our customers, with the actual work we do, the projects that we're on. It's all there if as leaders we can tap into it. Yeah, I, lo I love that. And I think Val, you've previously written a blog about marginal gains. Um, and we've, thinking we've, about that, yeah. Yeah, and we had yeah. uh, Andy Morgan in season one um, speaking about, you know, it's not about doing one thing 100% better, but doing 100 things 1% better. Yes. And so it's along similar lines. I love it. It's, it's amazing. But I just want to move on to your other book, Winning Well, A Manager's Guide to Getting Results Without Losing Your Soul. Is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Well, we talk about not losing your soul. What we're saying is, you know, that so many managers, you know, get to a point that they're feeling burned out, frustrated, disillusioned, uh, exhausted, isolated, bitter, um, you know, tired of the politics. And so, you know, mm. we are really big believers that you can get results and stay a decent human being and feel good about how you're showing up at work. It's not an either or. And so the, this book is, the, well, the one word everybody uses is, is that book is really practical. <laughs> so it's, you know, how do you have a tough conversation in the way that gets results and maintains the relationships? How do you run an effective meeting that gets results and gets the relationships, you know? And so it's, it breaks down and, you know, pretty, our favorite review of the book was somebody said, um, I feel like you could read it in the parking lot of your office before you went in, you go to the chapter of what you need to do, you go in, you do that thing, and it's going to work. I'm like, all right, we'll take it. <laughs> wow. Fantastic. So you've got some, you got some real practical then tables or or uh, processes that people can actually use in real really practical tools. Yes. And yeah. Both books are laid out that way, really to be practical roadmaps to help you manage your day to day. And then encourages cultures to the roadmap, the practical roadmap to build that kind of innovative Project culture. managers, PMI folks love winning well. Yeah. We have done so, we've done winning well programs at, you know, the PMI Global, PMI EMEA, like it's, the, it's those, it's that just because it's easy. It's, and I don't mean that because it's step by step and it's not theory, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, I can just use this on my project team right now. So. Yeah, brilliant. No, they're fantastic. And I'll have to, I'll have to purchase my own some, sometime soon. Um, obviously, I'll be at home, so I'll be doing a lot more reading. Um, I wanted to know then in the future, what's the next book you're working on? I'm sure there's something. Oh, there. gosh, no. You talked about, you talked about innovation. <laughs> so the problem is we just launched Courageous Cultures and it was three months three, ago and it was three years worth of research partnering wow. with the University of North Colorado. It, it was a lot. And then there was the book launch. So it's just like trying to have, um, ask a woman when she's going to have her next baby and she's still nursing. So no, <laughs> don't ask me that question right now. Wow. <laughs> That's good. And, and where can people get these books from if they're looking? So they are available anywhere books are sold, but the place that we would recommend you start for Courageous Cultures, you can go to CourageousCulturesBook.com. And there are free chapters, sample chapters there, the foreword by Dr. Amy Edmondson, the first chapters, you can download those. And there's some other resources and tools there too. But and, and all the Amazons, easy, you know, free shipping, all that stuff too. Brilliant. And then our website is letsgrowleaders.com. And you can also find all of the, the books and reference and resources there as well. And as you know, we're very active on LinkedIn since you were joining my Asking for a Friend <laughs> show earlier today. So um, we'd love to connect with any of your listeners on LinkedIn. And then I also have a podcast called Leadership Without Losing Your Soul. So you can go to Perfect. leadershipwithoutlosingyoursoul.com and find the podcast. So lots of different ways to connect. No, that's Thanks, fantastic. And dial over to you. Yeah, we'll, we'll include all of those links in, in the show notes as well. So people can, um, you know, find exactly what they need um, from, from the two of you. Um, but, you know, as, as we kind of head towards the, the end of the pod, Karen and David, um, thanks for your time. It's been amazing. I feel like we could probably be chatting for five, six, seven, maybe even 10 hours on, on this topic. It's something that Val and I are very passionate about. And, and obviously, and clearly, both of you are very passionate, knowledgeable and experienced in, in all of the above um i just wanted to to go to you to leave us with any final thoughts yeah so we would say be the courageous leader that you want your boss to be amazing amazing 
Want to top that, David? Is that it? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. That's, that says it all right there. No, absolutely. Right. Amazing, amazing thoughts to, to leave us with. Fel, any final words from you? No, I just wanted to say thanks for having you, having you guys on the show. It was great uh, insight. Uh, I can't wait to read your books. Uh, it was fantastic meeting you. Um, hopefully, I can get to the US at some point. We can, we can have a, a real beer together. That would be lovely. Uh, or equally well in your neck of the woods. <laughs> So, yeah. thank you, so thank you so much for having us. It's been absolutely our pleasure. No, thank you. And, and are there any plans post COVID to travel to the UK or, or us? Oh, we have no specific plans quite yet. We but had we, to cancel a trip yeah. to, um, to <laughs> Africa, which we should be in Africa right this minute. So oh, I'm yeah. like very sad about that. Uh, we were in the UK. <laughs> we were, um, uh, in last, in in Africa, last yeah. year, we were at, um, in Bristol, and then we were also in Ireland, in Dublin. We spoke at the uh, PMI conference in, in Dublin, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So um, we'd love to get to Australia. As soon as we can be <laughs> on a plane to some Anywhere. somewhere else, we're there. Anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a reason. I know. <laughs> i'm sure uh you know we, we 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 got quite a few listeners around the globe and hopefully uh you know someone will tap you on the shoulder and go come over and that would be lovely, kind of yeah. flight. but just before we go uh, we've got a pop quiz called tenor and i'm wondering if uh, you are up for it sure of course amazing so so we'll go one at a time and i'll hand to val to to pick his first victim righto i think um if we're gonna do this we might just get uh, maybe Karen, you go first and Dave, you go second. Okay. And I don't have to repeat the questions. Yep. Is that all right? Yep. Okay. I think I'll start with Karen then. Are you ready, Karen? I'm ready. All right. What's your morning routine? <laughs> it's always coffee first. Uh, <laughs> so I don't actually have anything terribly brilliant that I do, but I, it's, it's, it's uh, get the coffee and then clear out all the emails. So I wish I could say I did something exciting like a transcendental meditation or something brilliant like that, but it's more basic. When I do it well, it's tea reading meditation. Tea reading meditation. Beautiful. Um, black, tea, two, black tea specifically. Black tea. Okay. Uh, how do you usually plan out your day? I, you know, we really have this concept that we teach about the most important things and you, how you structure your schedule and your day and your time around your most important things. So the little clutter doesn't take it all over. And so I absolutely go into each day saying, what is the biggest strategic thing that I must accomplish and in terms of results or relationships? And, mm -hmm. you know, so sometimes, it, you know, so today was doing a lot of really strategic work around our marketing and, um, social media strategy. But part of it was really spent onboarding and building this relationship with this brand new employee we have and investing in her and getting to know her as a human being and, you know, snuggling her up a little bit, <laughs> you know, and all of that. And so sometimes it, you know, it, that, but that does become the most, is the relationship, a relationship thing could be the most important thing. Same. <laughs> Same. Perfect. Uh, question three, how do you deal with stress? Not well. <laughs> It's a bad week to ask. No, <laughs> uh, it, it depends on what kind of stress. I think it's it's interesting. Mm. Um, I, I I think I'm pretty good at handling the big stress, but if I am doing a um, if I'm running a live online program, so this happened yesterday, the other day. So David had to step away for just a minute because he runs all the tech. I don't have to, I don't do tech, but he had to go start another program upstairs while I was keeping things going. I had one job, just keep talking. To, well, accidentally, the e, his email pops up onto the thing and I am pushing the stream deck thing and trying to get that, the email to go away. Well, we have this thing where fireworks go to like celebrate a good idea. If somebody has a good idea, the fireworks start and will not stop. <laughs> I, I come back down. <laughs> Yeah, her eyes are wide. Like, oh. I don't, uh, and then that. my blood pressure at that point, you know, that kind of stress, like I get really panicky, <laughs> you know. So I think, but you know, for me also, though, exercise is really, really critical. Mm. If I'm not exercising, then I am, I'm not handling the stress like I need to be. Yeah. So I would agree with, with the exercise. And that for me, the, I mean, breathing helps, but like the, the number one thing for me is uh, if I can be in the mountains in Colorado, in the high mountains and hiking and, and experiencing that, that gives me perspective. It exercises my body. It 
reminds me that I'm a very small speck in a very huge universe and all mm. of which puts things into perspective. Brilliant. Uh, question four, favorite book, audio or movie? Oh, it's, it's oh, a wide range. <laughs> book, audio or movie? Oh, you can there's... pick any. So there's uh, so many, but um, I'm a big fan of anything that Seth Godin has written. Like pick a book, The Icarus Deception, yep. Tribes. Uh, and I feel like that is, and I'm active. I read his blog before I, that's part of my routine, actually. I read his blog before I even get out of the bed. Uh, and I, so I just, I think he's got a body of work that is really adding a, a significant mm. contribution. David's going to pick a fiction thing to bounce things out. I am. So, and I'm trying to decide like, you know, so I, I grew up for years as a huge Lord of the Rings fan, but if I go to current times, I mean, I have really been enjoying uh, Brandon Sanderson's series and the latest book. And it's what I'm currently reading. It's not, I've read a lot of nonfiction lately, but right now I'm in just starting a new fantasy novel called Rhythm of War, but he does a, fin why do I like this? It's, he does an incredible job of portraying a wide range of characters, people with different mental health challenges, physical disabilities, and it's not service to that. So it's not like proselytizing or anything. It's like an incredibly well-written, good epic story with these real characters. And that to me is good writing is when you can understand other people in a yeah, new yeah. way. And so that's, that's one I'm enjoying right now. Awesome. Question five, who is your hero and why? That's all. Oh, gosh. You go first. I have to go first. That's, <laughs> that's not the agreement. So we, we, uh, when, uh, when we decided to do the titling of our book, so uh, the first book that we wrote and we went with this since is we were talking about, well, there's two of us whose name goes first on the cover. I said, it should be you. And she said, why? I said, well, a couple of reasons. One, ladies first, but then Karen hurt, David die. So it's hurt and die. That's the logical sequence. <laughs> die and hurt is totally backwards. So yeah. You're buying time. I totally buy time. <laughs> totally I can see that. Uh, you land on one? Hero. It's so hard because there's so many reasons for so many different people for so many different reasons. I would have to say for me, Gandhi, what he did with what he had, talk about mm. influence mm. and yeah. calm and wisdom. And I wish I could, sometimes I try to channel that because it's the opposite of my person. My personality is so go do, right? And, 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 so, and just to be able to tap into that calm wisdom, I think is piece, a piece of it. And I think hero is probably where I'm tripping up. So I'm going to be like way overly analytic and say, I'm going to give you two leaders that I respect for different reasons. One is Mandela um, for the power of suffering and forgiveness and finding a way to lead through that in a reconciliatory way. Like it's just mind blowing mm -hmm. and completely yep. still needed in the world today. And then uh, I'm going to go back to the first U.S. president, George Washington, um, for one specific reason, not so much of the, you know, fording the Delaware and all that, all that kind of, I mean, he may have been a great military leader, any of that kind of stuff. The thing that stands out to me about his leadership and that I think was world changing is that he said after the second term of his presidency, he said, I'm done. And he set a precedent that for U.S. presidents that they leave office, which mm. is an interesting perspective. And I didn't start here, but now I'm ending this going, oh, and relevant today. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that Absolutely. from a leadership perspective that, you know, we talk about confident humility all the time. That's grounding the values of leadership. And he displayed that. And it was historically amazing and i don't think we recognize that today we just take it for granted until this month but just such a huge thing and so i really respect that aspect of his leadership oh, fantastic uh question oh sorry question six what is your favorite sound this should be easy <laughs> karen's laugh Aww. Aww. So That's nice. nice. Wait, you just you gave points. me one that made it easy. They got to hear it. Uh, I, I, I love music. I just love 
I love anything, you know, music. Uh, uh, pr I pretty much always want to have music, you know, in my life, so. Yeah, lovely. Question seven, what is the biggest mistake you've made on a project or with an organization or client? <laughs> I'll, I get this one, I could. I've got a several of them, but this was a big one. So I, um, I was the chief operating officer for a, uh, a NPO. Um, so we were relying on fundraising and, and contributions. And we had a, a seven figure level donor who also personality wise had a very strong personality and, and, and represented a lot of people with lots of personalities. And I had written a letter to our CEO, an email to our CEO talking about some of the challenges that she had raised and the way that she did and so forth. And I have a rule like, don't ever put anything in writing. You wouldn't be willing to see on the front page of, you know, the, the newspaper or website. Mm -hmm. And I read my first draft and went, that's not it. Nope. Start again. Wrote it again. Nope. Still not good enough. Wrote it again. was like, okay, yeah, that's good. Sent it to the president or the CEO went to lunch. I remember I was eating a spicy pasta dish because I got the fork halfway up to my mouth and went, oh no. <laughs> Set the fork down. I had walked to the restaurant, ran back to the office, looked up. Sure enough, I had not sent it to the CEO. I had sent it to her. Oh. And so, yeah. <laughs> And so I immediately had to go to the CEO and say, so I just made a bit of a mistake and we need to, you know, this is like major funding in jeopardy if this goes south. Well, it turned out, but like, I don't remember the, the resolution as much as the emotion of, I can't believe I did that. And it turned out okay. She thought I was blind copying her on the message to him to, to let her know I was representing her concerns. And the fact that I had done the multiple drafts made it read that way, but oh, I still get palpitations thinking about that. <laughs> so mine is uh, one of the signature stories that I tell in my keynote and I won't give you the whole five minute version of it, but uh, it was a time where um, I was not be being authentic with my team and I was asking my team to do something that I was unwilling to do. And uh, so basically I'd had a diversity council. I was putting together a diversity strategy. I got all these people together and I asked them to tell their, you know, talk about their personal experiences to inform our strategy. Well, I, I was a single mom at the time, didn't bring it up. Right? And I just feel like I'm tapping into these persons saying, yeah, I'm gay and this happened and I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm African-American, this happened. And, and I'm like, oh, everything's just, everything's great here. And uh, this woman called me out and she's like, you are a fraud because you are asking us to do this. But the truth is executives like you are afraid to be who you are at work. And this strategy is incomplete and you know it. And so I had to go back and tell everybody it was very, but the, the moral of that story is once I was able to really be vulnerable and to not expect my team to do things that I was unwilling to do, that's when we built the greater strategy. Because we did, it wasn't complete. We had to pull all that in. So sometimes your biggest mistakes can actually push you into mm. something bigger. These are, these are great questions. Uh, we're, we're getting a lot of insight. Uh, <laughs> what would you tell your 10-year-old self? I would tell my 10-year-old self to, you don't need, you know that song, uh, don't go, you don't need to live your life in one day. Don't go speed your time away. Yeah. It, yeah, I think that for me, it all, everything always feels so urgent and I must do this right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I, you know, I had to get the great good grades and I had to do this and I had to get married and I got married too young and right. And like, if I just slowed it down and been calm and like, let it be patient and let it play out, I think that would have been better. And I would tell myself almost the exact opposite, which is take more risks and, and, and have more fun and be less conservative than you were. There's a lot, it's a wide, big world out there. Go, go live it as a younger Absolutely. person. I got there as an older person, but yeah. Brilliant. Question nine, uh, what profession other than your own would you like to have attempted? Uh, I would have loved to be on Broadway as a singer and, you know, like, sh you know, shows. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I couldn't have done that. Um, I wasn't even close to being able to do that, but that would be my dream job to be able to do that. 
And, uh, oh gosh, there have been a lot of them over the years, but I'll go with, uh, I'm going to go with a fiction author. Can I do that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Cause we're nonfiction authors. So I don't know if author covers it all, but you would really like to be a fiction author. Like, yeah. 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 I don't know that I ever will be, but that would definitely, well, I'm be not going to be on Broadway either. I alternate think. paths. Yeah. Could do a fictional story about someone on Broadway. I don't know. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, question 10, the final one, and then I'll hand over to Dale. Uh, if you had to spend one million pounds or one million dollars a day, what would you spend it on? One million a day? A vaccine. I mean, <laughs> I really in, do. In, think... in, in a day, sorry. In a day. Oh, in a day. In a day. Yeah. I really, th- I mean, honestly, I think that's what the world needs right now is the, is uh, to spend money on um, so you'd spend help. it on distribution. Probably. Distribution of the vaccine, yeah. Well, great. Top <laughs> <laughs> that. Right? Yeah. No, you cannot top that. I <laughs> loved those. That's why I said it fast. Yeah, yeah, I didn't fast. want you to come up with it first. Get that in there. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you say anything uh, now, it's just going to sound silly. But yeah, I, yeah, I guess. Ice cream. I, I guess. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll just uh, lump mine in with the vaccine distribution then. Or <laughs> world peace. World peace. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think you're also incredibly uh, passionate about people t- having collaborative conversations. Like this is a this is a big thing. Yeah, you know, if 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 the vaccine distribution is taken care of, I would fund some type of work of getting people talking to one another. Um, I think that's mm. incredibly important. And the the information age has been so amazing, but it's also fract- caused fractures and we're all in the long tail of our own sound bubbles and, and everything. And, and so that's our echo chambers and it's not serving us. Yeah, Fantastic. I agree. Thanks, thanks guys for finishing that. That, that was... Really yeah, of good. course. I mean, if we had a half an hour more, I want to ask you all those 10 questions too. I feel, I feel bad. We shared all our stuff. No, you know, no, to be fair, yeah, to be fair, we've actually, there's, which episode was it, Dale? We've actually done this. About we? four or five ago. Um, we, we actually spoke about leadership, um, Dal and I. Hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah you, could, you could go back and have a listen okay. and there you go. All right. critique, critique us. <laughs> Great. Nice. What'd you, what did you spend your million dollars on? Was it a vaccine? No. <laughs> I can't even remember now. Can you? I, think, <laughs> I, I said property. Did you? Yeah, I said property. Oh, Investment. That's yeah. fair. I Make more, so then I could spend it on a vaccine. Exactly. exactly. I know that's what you're you taking meant. the long, the long view. I know that's Smart. what you're getting at. Sustainability, Smart. right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Dale. Let's over to you, mate. Thanks, Val, and thanks for that insight, David and Karen. Well, folks, that's all we have time for on this episode, but it doesn't have to stop here. Support our charities and access blogs at projectchatterpodcast.com. Don't forget to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel and on your podcast player so you don't miss the next one. A big thanks to our guests, David Dye and Karen Hurt, and thank you all for listening. Till then, we say stay safe, be disruptive, and have fun doing it. From me and Val, it's bye for now.